It's just the way it feels. I mean, I don't know what the context. Is. Yeah, what in what way? Um, I, I mean, I don't. I, I don't. I don't, I don't know. I can't uh, put my finger on it. Um, so, if you had me ask me the question, I wouldn't have said anything. But um, no, please, don't mind. I want you to. Ask I don't. I don't. I can't um, uh, articulate right. the difference. More, um, the more uh, uh, tangible or tangible. Uh, uh, maybe I'll think of something. It's going to be more speculative, less solid in terms of McCarthy. It more was was more wandering. I know that. What was that? No. Um, let's see. We are on. Parsha, still okay. Parsha, after yesterday, but still Parsha of Kayasara, right? Okay. Hello? Correct? Yeah. So you yeah. I have about uh, how okay. the Akeda, the interconnection of Sara's Kibura, and so on. Okay, that's enough. Yeah. Um, the great blessing that Abraham was blessed. Abraham, Gola Shabani, Barik Abraham. Um, oh no no that's Bar Bakol that's uh, we read we talked about that yesterday. Um, so. Um. Chaye. The Kadosh Baruch Hu. Chaye Sarah. Yeah. Hakadosh Baruch Hu Nikra Elokei Eretz Yisrael. There's a pasuk. Do you know about that? Um. In that particular word, we just know where we can go 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 for it. Sitkut afilu bebehemat shel tzadikim, behematam shel tzadikim. Okay, so you want to start that one? You want to do that one? Hakadosh Baruch Hu Nikra Elokei Haaretz, and also he says Shuat Avraham Hayta Nodaat Gamli Yitzchak. What do you mean? We'll see. Let's see. Let's see what this is. It's Kuflam and Dalit. He says. I'll, I'll tell you in a second, uh, Ariel, where we are. Kuflam Dalid, which is, which is, which is, which is, which is, uh, Pasuk, it, it is chapter 24, Chav Dalid, Pasuk Gimel, Chav Dalid 3, 24, 3, in the, in the Bible. 24, 3, it goes like this. Okay. Twenty four three, and I will have you swear by Hashem. Right. Mm -hmm. um, he he he, uh, Abraham. Twenty Abraham says to. Am I, am I missing something? Here? Yeah, Abraham says to to uh, Eliezer. Vashbiacha ba Adonai Elohei Hashemayim veElohei Haaretz. Right. That, that is the enigma of the phrase of Yalaki here. We'll see in a second, right? And I will make you swear, he says to Eliezer, his yes. servant, who is he going to send away? Mm -hmm. Excuse me. I, um, I saw somewhere that Eliezer was, in fact, Canaan. A Canaanite. No, in fact. Oh, that's, he, you mean he was Canaan? Yeah. Why would you say that? Where, why are we saying that? Sort of thing? I don't know why. I'm just saying. Yes, <laughs> Not him. Because he says, don't take any children from Canaan. Exactly. That's a lot of curiosity. Yeah. So that would be a little bit of a put down, no? Anyway, well, no, so he no, says no, to no, him. No, no, because no, no, he, he went from being uh, cursed. He was cursed by his father, Noah, to being blessed because he was. Um, he was uh, it was served of uh, Abraham so well that he was blessed. He wasn't being cursed, he was blessed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so he says to Eliezer, right, who is the elder of his house mm -hmm. and who dominates, who, who managed all that he had. Mm -hmm. 
I will have you swear by Adonai Elohei HaShamayim Elohei Ares. He identifies it. I will make you swear in God's name, Yudke Vavke, the Lord of the heaven and the Lord of the earth. Whatever that means, right? And it's not the first time it's been used. Malki Tzedek, Melech Shalem, also said, Elohei, Elohei HaShamayim, Elohei HaAretz. Did he not? Mm-hmm. When Abraham came back from the uh, dome of war, mm-hmm. where is it? Yeah, but the war with the, with the kings. With the kings, yeah. yeah. Um, um, Abimelech said to him, said, Blessed is Abraham. Uh, mm-hmm. The one who owns or who is the master of, I suppose, of the heaven and the earth. Okay, Shamayim Va'aretz, though, is mentioned there as well. Okay, is this the first time again now? Elohei Hashemayim Elohei Haaretz. The Ramban is going to talk about that in a moment. Asher lo tikach isha livni mivnotah kna'ani. Don't take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Kna'anites. Mm-hmm. Well, talking to a Kna'an himself would be a little hard, right? Asher anochi yoshei bekirbo, among whom I am dwelling. Right? right? Among mm-hmm. the midst of whom I am dwelling. So, ki el artziv Okay, so now... The Ramban is aiming to have this discuss this in Pasuk Gimel of the Ramban. I mean, why is he talking to the servant to tell him, you must not get a wife for my son from the house of, from the Canaanites, but you must go to go. Now, Yitzchak is not a 12-year-old boy. He's, a, he's an adult. Well, he's not so why doesn't he talk? Boy. He said the Eretz, the Yitzchak did not flee in Eretz Yisrael. And, um, uh, so, so in other words, he will have to marry somebody from outside this land without going outside the land. So you're trying to answer the question. Yeah. You're trying to answer the question. He's saying you should have told Yitzchak, mm-hmm. don't marry a man, mm-hmm. a woman from this land. Well, it could have been done, right? So then Yitzchak would wait for a foreigner to come. Or Yitzchak would oh, ask somebody uh, to go and get somebody. Right. But he, he was told by... Yeah. He has not been told. No? He has no. not yet been told not to leave the land. Because Why he, do you say that? No, because he, uh, after the Akedah... Uh, he the, was not told. No, 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 no. Later on, in this Parsha, later on, when he, his father passes away, mm-hmm. and he wants to go to... Philistine land to Egypt. He wants to leave the land because of the famine, like his father did. Mm-hmm. Hashem comes to him and says, "No, Gur Baaretz Azov, you dwell in this land, Beyeimach, and so on and so on." He was not yet reprimanded not to go. Okay. Okay. We. Okay. So why didn't Abraham tell him, you know, this is whom you shall marry? Aval. Aval. Nevertheless, he didn't do that. So what? Is this an explanation? But it sounds like he's trying to say what you said. He, he wanted, uh, during his lifetime, to send to his family and to his land and, to, and therefore to make the servant swear, whether in a lifetime or in his life. And therefore, he nevertheless had to tell the Ebed this and to tell him, I am commanding you, why is it not up to Yitzchak? Yitzchak could not have been told the same things that he just now said. Sounds like he's still bothered by the same idea that he doesn't want Yitzchak to leave. I don't know. In other words, 
it, it is apparent that Yitzchak would know what Abraham said to Eliezer. It's, it's, uh, it's understood. It's understood, he's saying. He didn't, he didn't make Yitzchak swear, but by telling the servant that this is what has to be done, whether I'm alive or not, you're the manager of the household, and I want to make sure that you don't marry, uh, you don't get a wife for my child who's from here, but from far away. Then Yitzchak understood that too. Uh, Okay, so maybe that's because it's not such a wonderful answer that Ramban is going to give you another one. Also possible, reasonable to think. Ooh. Now you're talking about something. He has a certain amount of power. Eliezer is an apitropos. Apitropos is a is a legal term for a person who is really has the authority to manage something economically, to do manage to economically manage for a child, for for a, for an estate. He could sell. He could buy. He could he could manage. He could <coughs> trade. He could do things, right? He doesn't have to go. To, he doesn't have to go to Abraham every moment to ask him what to do. He has the authority. So to do. I mean, Mikha is at least thirty-seven. You know? yeah. yeah. So apparently, he still, nevertheless, is going to. He's the one who's managing. That's what makes it difficult. I mean, he's not talking about Yitzchak as though he has any power. Yeah. Right. right. And therefore, he could command him because. He is saying to Eliezer, I am prepared to let Yitzchak inherit my property only on this condition, that he not marry somebody from here, that he marries from far away, right? And that's why the Pasuk says, Hamoshel, this Eliezer is described as a person who is in charge of everything that belongs to Yitzchak, to, to Abraham, right? Therefore, that, that is the suggestion, according to the Ramban, that he really has authority, economic authority. So he's making a condition about the economics of the family that this be done. And that's up to the other, because he's, he's the manager. So he's talking to the manager who's going to be in charge of the estate. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I mean, Pinky's asking the question, if Yitzchak is already an adult, he's 37 years old at the least, why, why does he need? Why does he need or forty? Why does he need an apitropos? Why does he need a manager? Why does he need, mm -hmm. Give him the estate. It sounds like he was still, like we said last Wait, night, protecting a lookmensh who was not mm -hmm. going to do too much estate. He was into spirituality and he was into that. He didn't want to do any business. He didn't want to be in charge of the management. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Abraham lets him do that. And you know, maybe he was uh, broken up by the death of his mother, because um, we, we see that... Um, uh, when Rivka came. What? When Rivka came. Rivka came. He says, Vayinachem aferei imo. And if he hadn't... Uh, he didn't, didn't get around consoled it. until then, right when he took a wife. Yeah. So he may be much more in mourning now. So he's not ready to do any practical stuff. He's mourning for his mother. Could be. Why? Yeah, he's suggesting. Why he didn't get married before? I don't know. Yeah, because mother why wants. Why don't his children? Uh, why don't get why don't get other married. why don't other kids don't get married early? I mean, I know some people get married late. Some people get married early. And How old was Abraham when he got married? Hmm. To Sarah. Do we know? No, we don't know. Could have been forty. Sure. I don't know. Could. 
believe so. I don't think it's good. Does it say? Does it say when he married her? No. When I, uh, when the beginning of Lech Lecha, does it say no. that he just no. took, that he took her for a wife, right? Yeah. Yeah. We know that right. yeah. years that he probably he was. Right. Abraham, no. Abraham. Lahem Nashim, Shem Eishet Abraham, Sarai Nishem Abraham. That's all. It doesn't say. Yeah. I mean, don't I don't, know. don't look at it from the uh, point of view of um, the we 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 our ages today. Asking a question, I, I, who knows? He was maybe he was dating and he just didn't find the right one. Mm-hmm. I, but, but no, he shouldn't have been dating because there, there was no one there. That's no, right. He couldn't have been dating. Or maybe he was dating and his, uh, that's why Abraham was worried because he was dating Canaanites and he said, uh, make sure that you get him to somebody or else he's not going to marry someone from here. Don't ask me. But what is and we're making up stories. There's no speculation. I mean, the, the, the Torah doesn't tell us. Why? Maybe he wasn't interested there. Yeah. Living in, he in was the, studying in the land and saw the people, the women were idolaters, <coughs> whatever. But up on the on the river, the other side of the river, it is the same thing. They are idolaters. You are asking the question, why send him away? Now you're asking a different question. Mm-hmm. Are you asking a separate question? Not because why he was not married earlier. You're asking what is the motivation for Abraham wanting to send him away to get a wife from there. They're also going to be idol worshippers. What's the difference right. between idol worshippers there and idol worshippers here? Do you have any suggestion and to an answer why that would be so? Maybe because <clears throat> maybe because the Canaanites were the two worst things I have to choose the less worse. So my family was idolaters, but uh, these Canaanites were idolaters, but. Social, their social behavior was so rash, so uh, evil, bad, evil, that, corrupt. that corrupted. Whereas, the whereas the people there are idol worshippers, but what's better about them? What so, what qualities do they have that might be better? I'm just giving them a chance to speculate. One moment, yeah. What, yeah. What, I, that's it's worth. But what is better? What? How do you know they're better in some way? If I, is if I have uh, uh, an unknown person. And I have um, a family, both are idolaters. So I have to choose. I have to choose my family because it's related. To or me. just that's all. Anything else? Mm, no. You don't have any hint. Think about this. I bet you can come up with an answer. How do you know that the people there, eventually, that people there are better than the people here? Do you know it from the story? No. You know it from the story. What's the story? story? What is the story? What does the story tell you? about them. The little bit that we do know about them, we know. Eliezer goes, mm-hmm. and he goes there, and he says, uh, eventually after this, he says, whose daughter are you? Um, whose daughter are you? Okay. So she says, I'm the daughter of, uh, you know, Betuel, Betuel, of Lavana and Betuel, as my brother, and there he says. Mm-hmm. So the, uh, he, man, the, she goes home, and she tells them, and she says, Listen, uh, of course I'll give you your water to drink and I'll give water to the, uh, to the Gamalim also. And not only that, when he asks her, he says, you have to come to our house because we've got a lot of room and we've got a place for your camels and we've got food for your camels and we have a place for you to sleep too and to food. So you see that little vignette of that image shows you that they had shared a little bit of the haknasat orchim, the hospitality, hospitality. And, and the openness to other people, the kindness. That Abraham, is, that Abraham is so famous for, right? Mm-hmm. So it apparently, we talked about this the last time, when he left Haran, he had already been there for a long time and had made some impact. Mm-hmm. And his family was already sort of influenced by him. Not so much, not to be idol worshippers, but certainly certain qualities of kindness, of, of chesed, mm-hmm. is there. Mm-hmm. So some people speculate that that would be the motivation for him to send them away. I know that they're idol worshippers, but chesed they have, and therefore they are much better than the people here. That could be one. Mm-hmm. Any other suggestion about why he would want them from there rather than from here? Maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. So he was saying the relatives are better than the strangers. I don't know why 
Some people's DNA is better than somebody else's DNA. So I don't know what the, uh, what else? No, it's a famous suggestion. A famous suggestion is that Abraham understood a sociological thing. If you have my son marry somebody next door, right? Now that's some, I am of one family. I'm one man, right? My wife is dead. I have one man. I don't have relatives. I don't have cousins. I don't have a clan, right? I have some people that I have, you know, with my soldiers, right? And my shepherds. But he's going to, I'm sitting, I'm living among a culture, among a nation, right? My son marries one of their daughters, right? So I will think to myself, I will be able to influence this daughter and I'll be able to keep them in the fold of my uh, atmosphere of my family, right? But that might be a losing proposition. That might be a very dangerous proposition to imagine because she has a mother and she has a father and she has a brother and she has cousins and she has a town, right? And where is my, where is the, where is the, the pull going to be better? Where is the pull going to be stronger to influence them and their children and their family after them? The, the influence is not going to be, and no guarantee that I'll be able to control the situation. The culture yeah, controls the situation, control. right? But if I get somebody from far away, assuming, forget about the chesed business, assuming they're the same, that person from far away is leading her family and her culture and her land and her place. And if she agrees to come here, she'll be in my home, right? And I'm the one who's going to create the atmosphere. She's not going to be a Canaanite. Right? She's not going to find, uh, you know, uh, a, a comfortable atmosphere there because she's a foreigner, right? She's a foreigner and therefore we'll be able to create the atmosphere in our home to influence that continuity better than if she was a, of a local person. So there's some people who say that that was pure, you know. Now, the, the fact, remember, the Pasuk here says, I want you to go to my does he say anything about the family? Look at the text. What is it? Text number seven, uh, number four. The very next sentence. Rather, you said you said twenty-four, to twenty-four or three. Rather, rather to my land and to my birthplace shall you go and take a wife for my son, for Isaac. I want to say from me, me, rashti, me, mishpakti, from my family, right? My birthplace. My right. Land. It doesn't say my, right, my land, my birthplace. Mm -hmm. Which is a little complicated, remember, because yeah. we said something no about Ur Kasdim. We, we have a problem with this text. I mean, you, 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 you see the enigma here? Remember, he was born in Ur Kasdim. Mm -hmm. Down. And he came to Haran. Haran, he saw Haran. Haran is not his birthplace. Yeah. I don't think. Oh. Right? Um, oh, Unless he was once born in Haran and then and went to Ur Kasdim and Ur. that's where they lived and then they came back to Haran. Right. I mean, it's possible okay. because the, otherwise it's a difficulty, right? Because he goes to Haran, the Aliyah, so he doesn't go to Ur Kasdim. Right. So you would have to say that it is very possible. I think the Ramban mentioned somewhere there's a complicated biography of Abraham and his father, Terah, that they might have been in Haran first. Abraham was born, he was a baby. And they traveled to Ur Kasdim. Business was better, right? Uh, oil wells, maybe. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then, because it's in uh, further in Iraq or something like that, so they have some oil there. So he became an oil magnate, right? So he went down there. And then Abraham is growing up, and he got in trouble with the king because mm -hmm. of this idol-worshipping business. And that's why, when they had to run away, where are they going to go? Remember, they were thinking of going to Canaan, but they stopped in Haran, where they had some familial, you know, friends and some acquaintances because they had been there before, according to this story. There were two kingdoms, isn't it? Babylonian? I don't know about kingdoms. I don't know about, I don't know about kingdoms. It doesn't matter. But, the, but Ur Kasdim and Haran were interested, mm -hmm. right? So if Haran is where he was born, he's going back. He went back to his birthplace from Ur Kasdim. And there, Abraham gets the message from Hashem saying, Lech lecha mi artzecha mi noladetecha Remember, we did that last week. Hashem also tells him, go and leave your land your and your place. birthplace. So, and he's the talking same. to him in Haran. Right. So that means Haran is his birthplace, according right. to that scenario, right? Mm -hmm. He didn't say this to him in Ur Kasdim. He said this to him in Haran. Mm -hmm. you remember the Ramban. I mean, we talked about this last week. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. But he certainly doesn't say, go to my family. 
Doesn't say that. Mm-hmm. Right. So if he is confident, like you said, that maybe there's more chesed there, people are better, even though they're idol worshippers, it doesn't mean he's going to his family. It doesn't mean his DNA. Mm-hmm. He's talking about maybe the chesed, maybe he in, he civilized that place. Maybe not just his family, you know, the town. The town of Urkatim is a better place in terms of humanity because of Abraham's having been there before. Better than in Quran. He could have observed that. He might have observed that. Remember when he walked around and he went to Mitzrayim, he had to lie about his wife being right. his wife. And he was asked, why did you do this to us? So he said, I saw that there was no God-fearing mm-hmm. attitude yeah. in this place. Everybody's corrupt. I knew that if they were my wife, they would kill me. Mm-hmm. Now, what kind of a society is that to kill somebody who has a wife? Mm-hmm. Right? Because you think she's beautiful, so you kill the husband and you take the wife. I mean, that's an example of real corruption, right? Mm-hmm. Real mal- malignant. It's almost like stone, right? Mm-hmm. If Abraham was that so, is, was so that certain, that's, that's me trying, right? Yes, that's right. But if I, Abraham is so certain of that, who knows what Canaan, Canaan was like? It wasn't as bad as that, because otherwise he would have had to lie to the people in Hebron that his wife was his sister also. He didn't, didn't say that. In fact, some of the people in Hebron seemed to honor him and to respect him mm-hmm. and were ready to give him they a call burial him place. Him. You are a prince of God. Prince of us. God. So that's... Yeah, so you, it's, a good, it's a good question to speculate why he didn't want to have the people from here marry his son. I think the social pull against, against his influence would have been the special reason. That's, I think that's an exil, that's a, a semi zavar, if I'm not mistaken, to say that. So, but he doesn't talk about family, and I want to mention that here because you will see when you read the Parsha, when you read the Parsha this weekend, you'll see that Eliezer, when he comes to Lavan, and he tells him the story. When I came to the well and I made this test with God and I, and I said to God, if, if this woman comes and says the following thing, then I will know, right? And he says to her, whose daughter are you? And she says, oh, I'm the family of Bituel. She says, oh, thank God that he has given me the daughter of the family of Abraham. He says that to the family. He says that to the family because that makes them feel very special. They were chosen by God. Yeah, because he, he was not. He didn't say. He didn't say to God himself. He, when he was talking to God, he didn't say, "I want you to find me a daughter from the family of Abraham." Yes, and he says. He, he says to the family that that's what he said. And he he said changes he, the story. He went to out of the city. Said it. Yeah, to the wells, right? Yeah. So that means that whoever can come and. Whoever, whoever, whoever. Yeah. right? That when the woman who says that, then you have proven that she is the right one. That's all. Then when he speaks to them, he says to him, he says to them, "My master sent me to find someone from his family." Hmm. Makes him feel very flattered. I mean, yeah. Yeah. My master, my master is a very rich man. He's powerful, and he wants you. He wants you know. He wanted me to go to you. And you are his favorite people. But it's not true at all. Uh, no, no, that, that wasn't intend, intended. It happens right. that that's the woman who came out that Hashem had showed him is the right one. But it wasn't, it wasn't the command. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So anyway, there, there are very interesting things about the story that the Eliezer says. But anyway, okay. So, so far we have um, the fact that he was asking him to get this wife. So look at the Ramban. Uh, about El- when he says Elohei Hashemayim Elohei Aretz, see the Ramban, the mm-hmm. next piece of Ramban. Mm-hmm. He says, "I want you to swear in Yudke Vav Stays K's name, the Master of the Heavens and the Master of the Earth." Right? Mm-hmm. What does that mean? So he says, "Hakadosh Baruch Hayikare Elohei Eretz Yisrael." Now that is very interesting because if I were to tell you how to translate that sentence, you would say. God of the heaven and the earth. The earth meaning the universe, the planet, the, the, everything, right? Not Haaretz, meaning the land of Israel. Mm-hmm. Right? This is quite original of the Ramban to say. He's translating it mm-hmm. as the God mm-hmm. of the heavens and the God of this land mm-hmm. of Israel. Eretz Israel. Haaretz. By the way, that's a Zionist uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. nomenclature, right? 
שהיא עושה את זה, אוקיי? אלוקי ארץ ישראל, כי דכתיב לא ידעו את משפט אלוהי הארץ. This is a sentence, he's, pro- he's proving this by quoting a pasuk from Kings, Malachim Beit, that the people did not know the, the laws of God of the earth, meaning of that land, the God of Elohei Eretz Yisrael, mm-hmm. yes? V'katuv, v'yidabru el Elohei Yerushalayim, ke'al Elohei Ami, k'diktiv, lo yadu et mishpah, I'm sorry, et Elohei Amei Ha'aretz. They, this is a reprimand, this is from 98, this is Dibrei Hayamim, Beit, they, this is a reprimand. They, people, started talking about the God of Yerushalayim like they talk about the God of all the other nations, mm-hmm. right? So you see that there's such a thing as the God of Yerushalayim or the God of Eretz Yisrael, he's trying to tell you. The Yesh Bazes Sod, and there is a special secret, there's a special uh, deep idea in this. Od Ektavenu, Be'ezrat Hashem, I will write about this yet in the future, mm-hmm. you say. And 99 tells you that he talked about this in Sefer Todot, which is next to this parsha. Divrei Amin vayishmor, u v'sefer achrei mot, divrei Amin vatitamei ha'aretz. Right? Okay. So we'll come to it. But now, aval, v'pasuk lekachani b'beit avi, lo ne'emar bo Elohei ha'aretz, ke'ya v'charan, o b'ur kazdim. Right? Pasuk Zayin, if you look at this, look at the chapter, the next uh, few psukim. Vayomer Elav Avraham. No, uh, Eliezer asks him. Look at the Pasuk Hey, we'll go in order. Mm-hmm. Eliezer asks him, what if the woman doesn't want to go with me? Should I take Yitzchak there? Do you see that, Pasuk number four? Yes. See that? Yeah. Should I take him there, right? From that land that you went out. So Ayomer Elav Avraham, so Avraham says to him, you be very careful, Yishamer Lecha, be you beware, pen tashivet mishama, you that not to bring, be, you know, lest you bring my my son there. Adonai, Elohei HaShamayim, God of the master of the heavens. Asher lakachani v'beit avi me'er tzmoladeti, asher diber li, asher nishva li le'mor ezarcha etzen etzarz azot, hu yishlach melachav lefanav alachat anish me'ineh. Right, he is the man who took me from there, He's the one who will find a way to make sure that you will be able to bring the wife of my child here. Now, you, do you notice all of a sudden he says, Hashem Elohei HaShemayim? Don't say Elohei HaAretz. Mm-hmm. In this pasuk, Zayin, what happened to Elohei HaShemayim and Elohei HaAretz? Do, do you notice what the, the Ramban is pointing out? It is, it is strange. I never noticed it before, right? But you see what he said? God, the heaven, the God of the heaven, the Lord of the heavens, who took me from my father's house. Da, 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 da. What do you mean, God? Uh, oh, did, did God just lose the the title of Elohei Aretz just because he's in a different sentence? Makara. So the Ramban, what happened? So the Ramban is saying that when he was in Haran, and Hashem commanded him to take him out to go to Eretz Israel. He was Elohei Ha'aretz. He was Elohei HaShemayim there because he was not on the land where God was the mm-hmm. Lord of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The God is not the Lord of Haran. God is the Lord of Eretz Israel. So when he is talking about Elohei Ha'aretz, he's talking about Elohei Eretz Israel. Eretz Israel. And now I am standing now in, Elo- in Eretz Israel. Therefore, I could say God is the God of the heavens and the God of this land. And the God of this land. When I was in Haran, God of the heavens told me to go from there. That's quite... uh, Now, what do we mean? What do we mean by saying that God is the God? He's saying there's a deep secret here, you understand? Mm, Right. There will be two places in the Torah where he will speak about it, maybe more so now here also, I don't know. Right? But he's trying to prove to you that Abraham himself, when he uses the word Elohei Haaretz, he means this land. The land where he's standing, Eretz Israel. There is an note here that says that we take him there. Yeah. Future, future discussion. Yeah. See Ramban on Leviticus 1825, where right. he explains that each country has a supervising angel. Yes. That represented and guided affairs from heaven. Eretz Israel, however, is guided directly by God. Directly. Himself, directly by, by God himself. 
himself without an angel to act as an in intermediary. This is why God, why God is called the God of the Lamb. This is God. Nahuan. Nahuan. So That's one of the things that he's mentioned, right? That a God, all the other nations, not only the, he says this about the nation as well, all the other nations and all the other lands have, have a natural life, which is also uh, guided or supported by God. But God does that through a messenger, through a, an intermediary, right? Like an angels, angel. if you like, or, or astrology, if you like, uh, whatever other forces, right? Through a sort of a more indirect, an indirect connection mm -hmm. to the other nations and to the other lands. While in Eretz Israel, God is directly involved directly involved, himself, himself. That is very good, and that is also very bad, right? Because if you're standing in God's house and you're standing right in front of God, then you better be careful how you behave much more than if you're standing in front of his minister, right? I mean, right? He is able to give you his love and his attention, communicate directly, very beautiful, very wonderful. Yes, you're in his presence. But also, he cannot tolerate the kind of behavior in Eretz Israel that he can tolerate in, 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 uh, in Mansi. Mm -hmm. So when you go to Eretz Israel one day soon, yes, sir. you will have to purify yourself in your thinking and your behavior even better. You don't have to do very much because you're already pure. <laughs> but I mean, even more than you do here. Yes. Because God is he's looking, he's present, he's smiling, he's there. He's there, right? direct, right. very uh, profound idea, right? And that's why many times the Torah says, you know, but Titame, you, you have defiled the land, all of your mm -hmm. things, and therefore I'm going to send you into exile. What, what good does it do to send you? If he, if he hates people to, do, to behave a certain way on the earth, then what difference does it make if it's in Brooklyn or if it's in Yerushalayim? No, because there is a difference, right? This is my land, God says, right? There's something holy about this place. I directly, this is my home. Right? So to speak. Right? I'll send you out of here because you, you can't behave that way in my house. Go. Right? Over there, it's farther away from me. I'm out of sight a little bit. I mean, somebody else is taking care of it. I have a manager. Right? Is it a blessing? I don't know. Right? Why he allowed people to defile the land? He doesn't people that. Well, he, Jewish. Not Jewish. Not Jewish people. People, we know. <laughs> Why he promoted. I don't know. He certainly didn't want to, right? He, he sent the Jewish people to conquer the land and to make it a holy land. So now we, de we defiled it, and so uh, he expelled us, and he let other people in. Maybe it's better for other people to defile the land than the naive, than for us, his children, to defile the land. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so let's, get, let's go. It's very good questions. So, right, so far, so far, so far, so good. So that's what Elohei Haaretz means. And therefore, they have said, a person well, like me, like me, and like Eliyahu, who lives outside of Eretz Israel, is like a person who doesn't have a God. Mm -hmm. Because he's not directly, right? Mm -hmm. So to speak, right? They have chased me away from my land, telling me I should serve other gods. Other gods meaning when you're outside, you don't have your God. You're serving the manager that God has appointed on this land. So, well, that's, that's going to go too far. I don't know. All right, so we've got, we got one major principle. If you wanted to follow up on this concept of how God is really the Lord of the land in a different way, then he says here that you look at two other texts. One is in Leviticus 18.25, like you said, mm -hmm. and the other one is next Parsha, Toldot, Chavav Hey. I don't know, sure, if that is so close, should we do it? I don't know, Chavav Hey. Well, we can continue. Continue with? With? Continue with? Um, what, we're doing. what we're doing. As we just finished with what we're doing. Um, the next one, oh, do, you, do you want to do in the writing itself about the, 
Chalikim Meitim B'Savea, Savea Liyamim, I mean, we, we talked about it back in the Shur, and we did again. Lamed Be'er, Hatzitzkut Afilu Be'behem Kam Shel Tzadikim. How does that come up? Lamed Be'er. Well, I'm just curious, what pasuk could that be? That the creatures themselves, Lamed Be'er, Be'yavo Ha'isha Baita. Oh, this might be nice. Look at the, look at the, um, Verse number 20, uh, 32 here in this passage. Remember, Eliezer, Eliezer goes, and he, uh, and he finds Rivka, and then he goes to their home, right? Mm -hmm. He goes to the home of Lavan and Betuel. Look at the, start from Pasuk uh, 31. Vayomer, Lavan says to him, Bo Baruch Hashem, come, come. you blessed one of God, which is interesting, right? You see that they talk, they talk uh, Jewish talk, right? Lama tamod b'chutz. Why do you stand outside? Ve'anochi piniti abayit u'makom lagmalim, and I have empty, cleared the house, you know, made room for you, and a place for the camels. So far, so good. Are you there? Yes, sir. Rebecca said that. No, no. He said that. Lavan said, said, said it. He ran out there and he yes. said, yes, yes. Okay. And he sees the man. Rivka goes home and tells her brother about this. And mm -hmm. Lavan mm -hmm. goes out to see him and he says, why do you stand outside? I've made mm -hmm. everything ready for you. Yes. So Eliezer, the Ish, because that's what he's called. It's mm -hmm. Yikodim. He, the man, comes to the house. And he, he, um, he undoes the, uh, he unhitches the saddles or the bags from the back and he gives straw and feed to the camels to eat and water to wash his feet and the to water to wash the feet of the people who are with him and they put food before him right the, the, the hosts of the house Vayomer, and he said, well, I can't eat. I can't eat until I tell you my message. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've got a job to do. I, I'm not going to sit here and have a good time. First, I have to tell you my message, what I have to do, what my job is, right? Yes. And he tells him the message from Abraham that he has to find his dog, right? Mm -hmm. So now, on this pasuk, Lamed Beit, about bringing in the animals and the camels, <laughs> Ramban has something to say. Look at this. Vayavo Aisha Baita. Eliezer Hu Aisha Ba. Right, obviously, Eliezer was the man who came into the house. See that? Vayafatachad mm Malim, -hmm. he undoes the Malim's load. Yachazor al Lavan. We thought the Pasuk is straight. That the man, meaning Eliezer, comes into the house, and he, the man, Eliezer, takes off the camel's saddles and he gives them to eat. Right? And then he washes his feet. Right? But he says, no, no, no. Break up the sentence a little bit. The man, Eliezer, comes into the house, and Laban, who is the host, undoes the camel's saddles. Mm -hmm. Why? He's the host. He's the one who's kind, right? Here's a man who's been traveling all this time. He's tired. So he brings Eliezer first into the house, and then he, the host, Laban, takes the off the saddles from the gmalim, in order to help his uh, guest. Fa'itain lahem, teben, and Lavan gives feed and straw to the, you know, the camels. Vinatan mayim lirchot sarag Eliezer, and he, Lavan, gives water to wash the feet of Eliezer. Here, clean yourself so you can have a chance to wash your feet, refresh yourself, and to his people, raglea nashim ajarito. Right? So now we're making Lavan much kinder than we thought before, right? He brings the house, and then Lavan does everything for him right now, right? Well, it looks like a scene Abraham. Very nice, before, very nice, yeah. Uh, this is the paradigm of Abraham, right? Exactly, paradigm of Abraham, very nice. Mm -hmm. Right? It, it, it's a little far-fetched. It's okay for him to come and take the saddle off his camels, but it would be hard for him to say, he and he, Eliezer, took water for his feet to wash. It's the host who gives him water. He wouldn't take water, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. 
ויעברו אנשים מדענים סוחרים, וימשכו ויעלו את יוסף מן הבור, כי ימשכו וימשכו חוזר על אחד, הנזכרים בפסוק הראשון. Now that is quite controversial, but you remember the sentence when Yosef was sold by his brothers. How was he sold by his brothers? Some people say in the pasuk only says, but in the sentence in the pasuk says they put him into the pit, mm-hmm. right? And they went down to eat. They sat down to eat. Mm-hmm. And then the pasuk says, and a caravan of Midianim, of Midianites, passed. And they pulled him out of the boar, out of the pit, and they sold him to the Ishmaelim, and they went to Mitzrayim. Mm-hmm. If you read the Pasuk, the brothers have nothing to do with it. Mm-hmm. If you literally read the Pasuk straight forward, they put him in the pit, and they're sitting and eating, right? And while they're eating, it would look like from the Pasuk, and while they're eating, These caravan came by, they heard a guy calling from the pit, they pulled him up from the pit, they took him and they passed him from hand to hand and different merchants until he came to Mitzrayim. So what happened to the brothers selling Yosef? They didn't sell Yosef, they put him in the pit, according to Mm -hmm. straight reading of the Pasuk. So he says, in the same way as I'm telling you that now about Laban, you break up the Pasuk, right? Eliezer came and he took the saddles off the camel, that he is Laban, not Eliezer, according to this. I mean, it could be also that, here he's saying, it could be that, the Ishma, the, it could be that, I mean, uh, when the first Yosef, that the Yimshiku refers to his brothers. That's, that's what he's, that's exactly what he's saying, correct. Vayavru, yeah. Midianites came by, and they, they pulled the boys out of the pit, not the Midianites, The brothers. Oh, the brothers. I mean, that, we're trying to explain how do the brothers sell Yosef. There's a problem, right? The Pasuk doesn't say the brothers sold Yosef. Mm-hmm. And everybody knows the brothers sold Yosef. So how do they, we say the brothers are guilty of selling Yosef? The brothers are guilty and we're always being punished for that brothers who brotherly village. I mean, and if you look at the Pasuk, it doesn't say the brothers will sell Yosef, right? So you have to sometimes say that when a, when a, when a sentence lists a lot of things in pronouns, The Midianites came, that we know, mm-hmm. and they pulled him out of the pit, usually, and they means the same people that you started the sentence with, exactly. but we are making a change, mm-hmm. just like we're doing it here. The man came into the house, and he took the saddles off. Who's he? Yosef. No. The Ramban just said it was Laban. No, no. You are right that usually you would say it's Eliezer, mm-hmm. but you just read the Ramban. The Ramban said, no, 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 that's not the way it was. It was Eliezer who came into the house, and he, meaning Laban, took the saddles and helped them out and gave him the water and da-da-da, right? Because like Abraham, he was very kind. It doesn't work with the grammar. Usually the sentence wouldn't say that, but you see that we broke it up and we said the man is Eliezer coming up to point, and he means Laban going forward. You understand what's going on? So he's saying this is the same thing that we can say with the Midianites. The Midianites came, and they, meaning not the Midianites, but the brothers, pulled them out of the pit and sold them. Mm-hmm. So they are the guilty ones. They are the ones who sold them. Mm-hmm. He wasn't kidnapped by I the mean, uh, I mean, like he, he said that Yosef is fleeing. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's what he said. Uh, of course, <laughs> that's the scenario that you would usually... I mean, you're right. If the brothers didn't sell them, how do the Midianites know that there's a man in the, in the pit? So he was saying, brothers, brothers, let me out. Let me. I guess, what is he doing, sitting and eating lunch? I mean, he's, he wants out. So I suppose, uh, you know, if the scenario is that they didn't sell him directly, they're guilty anyway because they put him in harm's way. I mean, they put him in right. a pit. And anything could happen to a man in a pit. He could have been killed. He could have been died of thirst. They, they didn't want to, they, they, they didn't decide to sell him, right? According to, no, no, I mean, the Ramban says they did, right? They could yell at, at, at the media the and say, they hey, we have a, a, a guy here, we, we, I, we want to, to sell him, take it out. Yeah, but it doesn't say so, right? The brothers are sitting to eat, it says. The brothers went to eat. And the Yundi Knights came. So that excuse me, yeah, the Knights, so, 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 so,
so they would have, so the Torah doesn't say anything about it. And and the brothers said to them, "Hey, take this guy." I mean, what? You're not going to mention that that he did. I mean, that's, that's that's a peculiar way to talk. Yeah. Um, they put him into the pit. And they sat down to eat bread. And they saw, and they, there's a Yishmaelite caravan coming. Migilad. And they're carrying a lot of uh, spices. They're going to Mitzrayim. So Yudad says to his brothers, Why should we kill our brother? And try to hide his blood. Let's go sell him to the Ishmaelites that we see out there. They're eating and they see the Ishmaelites coming. They're not there yet, right? From far away. They say, hey, I have an idea. Why don't we sell him? Instead of killing him, why don't we sell him? Just get rid of him that way. Mm-hmm. And then our hands doesn't have to be hurting him. He'll just be gone. Because he's our flesh and blood. So we can't really kill him. But we can get rid of him that way. Mm-hmm. And his brothers hear him and they agree. Okay. Now, so they intend to sell him to the Ishmaelites. They intend. They're sitting here eating. They see this caravan from there. So one scenario would be that when the Ishmaelite came, they sold him to them. Right? But the other possibility is, remember, look at the next passage. It says, Vayavru anashim midyanim, socharim. In the meantime, while they're sitting and eating, and they have this plan to sell him to the Ishmaelites, two different people, right? The Ishmaelites are not Midianim. Mm-hmm. Midianites are Midianites, and Ishmaelites are Ishmaelites. Mm-hmm. So they're on a, they must be on a path, you know, on a, on a trek that the caravans use. They look down from where they're sitting and eating. The pit is over there, and they're sitting away, far away from the pit, because they don't want to hear him sh- cry, crying so much, right? They want to eat with a good appetite. So they're sitting over here. The pit is over there. And they look there and they see Ishmaelites coming. Right? And they say, you know what? It's a good idea, Yehuda. We, when the Ishmaelites come, we'll take him and sell him. But in the meantime, it takes a little while for the Ishmaelites to come. So we can eat this peanut butter sandwich that we have and we'll wait for a little while. Right? Okay. Then the Torah says, what? in the meantime, Midianites came to the boar. To the boar. And their merchants. And they pulled Yosef from the pit. And they sold Yosef to the Ishmaelites. For 20 silver pieces. And they brought Yosef to the shrine. This goes against our position that the brothers sold him for... Uh... So that's the problem, right? That is the problem. What what happened here? Yeah, with, with this now lying. Yeah. I mean, it's so so it's a, it's a peculiar story. So what do we do with the story, right? The brothers are sitting here at the pit, at the at the at the food place, right? The pit is over there. They say yes, we are going to sell them to the Ishmaelites that are coming. And in the meantime, the pasuk says, and Midianites came. We don't know anything about Midianites. Where are they from, right? And they pulled him out of the pit, and they sold him to the Ishmaelites, and the Ishmaelites went to Mitzrayim. So the Ramban is telling you, he's trying to deconstruct the sentence the way he's doing with Eliezer, right? Because if you don't do it, then the brothers never had a chance to sell the, the brother, the, the, their brother, right? Yehuda and his brothers never sold Yosef because this all happened between two other groups. The Ishmaelites sold him to, the, the Midianites sold him to Ishmaelites and they only intended to sell him but they never had a chance to sell him because the, the Torah doesn't say that they got him. They actually did it, right? Mm-hmm. So, the, I'm trying to, to, so the Ramban is saying what we understand is that they did sell him. They intended to sell him and when the Midianites came, the Midianites came, the brothers saw the Midianites come to the pit they were close enough to see what was going on. And they, the brothers, said, wait a moment, Midianites, you're passing by. You don't even know. We have some great uh, sale for you. Well, let's pull out this, my, our brother, and we're ready. Oh, we didn't say it's his brother, right? Yeah. We have this slave here, and we're ready to sell him to you for just a little bit of money. He's not worth much to us. You can have him, right? For a little bit of money. 
the Yish, the Midianites, the Ishmaelites are not here yet, right? So the brothers were so excited that they had, they were going to sell it to the people, but you know, it's going to take a while for them to come. And here, all of a sudden, we see Midianites have come, right? So let's sell them now. So the brothers, according to them, according to the Ramban, see the Midianites, Vayim Shechu, and pull them out of the door is the brothers. And they sell them to the Midianites, who then eventually give it to the Ishmaelites. And the uh, one, one merchant after another, you know, people trade these things and you're going all the way inside. That's quite a scenario, right? What does it do for us? It only does for us to maintain the idea that the brothers actually sold their brother, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. if not for that, you would say they intended to sell the brother, but you don't have it in the text. It's more important to the Ramban to establish that pasuk being broken up than for Eliezer. I mean, who cares if Eliezer did the uh, the saddle, the unsaddling, and took the water or not? I mean, so Lavan did it. I mean, here he's saying that Lavan did it because he was kind, right? But he's trying to tell you this is the same kind of peculiar reading that you can do the pasuk, because the pulling him out of the pit is actually attributed to the brothers. Okay, v'chein. So right? It's a long story. I don't know if you want to if you want to go into that. No. Okay, good. It's a story that's interesting about Mephibosheth. Okay, who is this one of the of the hint of the followers of Shaul that uh, that that David is kind to. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. Vinyan vayiftach agmal vayiftach agmalim shepitech moserei tzavaram ki aminhag lahalchim kishurim o shehayu alchim chagurim b'moshav hamerkava asher alehem. Right. What do you mean? He opened. The Gamalim. What do you mean by unloaded the Gamalim? So he says, one possibility is the camels. He took the bit out of their mouth. You know, because usually when they're going, they have a bridle, you know, mm -hmm. or in their mouth and they're pulling. So he either took that out from around their neck or that they are with, uh, you know, belted with, uh, with a place to sit for the saddle. Okay. Good. So far, so good, right? The Rashi Katab, he tears Zamam Shalahem, Shaya Sotem Piem Shaloya Yeru Besadot Acherim. And he, Rashi says, that he took out the bit from their mouth, which was like a, um, a, a muzzle from their mouth, that they were accustomed to do in Abraham's house to make sure that the camels, when they're going, wouldn't eat something that didn't belong to them. Yeah, but who, who, right? Who, who's doing it? Well, Eliezer had done that. But, but, oh, oh, In other words, oh, these oh, were his camels oh, right, that right. needed to have something untied. Right, what was right, untied? Right. The saddle, we thought. Oh, okay. Maybe the, the, uh, the, um, the, the bit. Right. Maybe the muzzle, Rashi says, because of this special precaution not to have somebody eat, their camels eat from somebody else. Well, Ashon Breshit Rabbi, he tears in mayhem. Rabbi Huna, Rabbi Yunia, Sha'al, Rabbi Chia, Rabbi Abba. Right? Right? Is, is it possible that the camels of Abraham, you're telling me that they had a muzzle. Muzzle, why did you give them a muzzle? Because if you didn't have the muzzle, they would eat the grass from somebody else's field. So you happen to have a muzzle, right? But there's a story about the donkey of Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair. There was a story of Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair. What is that? So if you look at the bug, the story of Chalif Pesach in your ear, he says here, where is it? Ah. He would not eat. This, this donkey was instinctively unable to eat something that didn't have truma and maser taken from him, 
Mm-hmm. And wouldn't eat something that didn't belong to him, wouldn't eat anything that wasn't kosher. Mm-hmm. He was a donkey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a donkey of Roksul. <laughs> so they're saying that you see that the camels of Abraham were not as great as the donkey of Pinchas ben Yair. Right? Vezu she'ilali store patua hazaman. And this is actually meant to contradict the idea of a muzzle. Because after all, Abraham was a greater tzaddik than Pinchas ben Yair. So if the animal of Pinchas ben Yair knew how to behave himself, certainly the camels of Abraham would know how to behave themselves. So they wouldn't need a muzzle. You could have a saddle if you like, yes, but you wouldn't need a muzzle. Right? Right? Couldn't be more righteous, right? If it's possible that the donkey of Pinchas ben Yair would not need any muzzle, any special precaution to make sure that he doesn't eat something that is not appropriate for his master to feed him, all by himself he would be, certainly the, the camels of Abraham Avinu, they wouldn't need a muzzle. Because he's quoting a pasuk from Proverbs. Mishle, from Proverbs, that there is a, 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 an inadvertent sin does not happen to a tzaddik. Mm-hmm. He is somehow protected from this, right? After all, remember, if the camel eats, if my camel eats your field's grass, then I'm responsible. I, I am the one who's the damager. The camel doesn't know any better. The camel is just mm-hmm. uh, an animal. But you could come to me and you could say, hey, you stole some of my grass. You have to pay me. It's not right. right? Mm-hmm. And, if I, and if he does that and you never found out, then I have some robbery in my, on my record, right? I mean, and I wouldn't even know about it, so I would never pay you. So it would be a sin on my part, right, that I don't even know. Right? So it is, I have to be careful of my animals all the time and be careful to commit an offense, make a muzzle on them to make sure that they don't hurt any of us without me knowing. So, so the, the Shemishle is trying to say that God somehow protects the righteous person from being, uh, from sinning without knowing. I think this is really referring to more of a person than a mere a cam- person's camel. You would think. Yeah. Except that he's using it here for animals. Uh, yeah. But right. All right. He is. Now, it's my property... If I am a special, this is the Ramban, it's obviously a very, you can debate this, if you whether you believe that God does this, right? But God is taking care of a righteous person. You want to be a righteous person, you are a very, very good person. In general, you always are careful about the way you behave. Then God helps you that your baby doesn't hurt somebody else, that your animal doesn't go and hurt somebody else in a way that would make you responsible. Mm-hmm. He helps you. Mm-hmm. Somebody else's animal would not. And that sounds like a little bit far-fetched, right? That, that the camels would not eat grass because they come from Avraham's house. I mean, it, 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 the Pazit says that he took the muzzle out. So nobody no, it doesn't say. It says, Vayifatach. No, no, no. The word Vayifatach means he opened up the whatever from the Gemali. Look at the Pasuk. Vayifatach. Where is it? What Pasuk? Lamed Bey, right? So read the Pasuk Lamed Beit. Chavdal Lamed Beit, right? Is that what I said? No. Which Pasuk? What Perak are we in? Chavdalet Lamed Beit, yeah. Right? No. What animal was he? What Pasuk? What Perak are we on? He said, the Pasuk says that... Uh, he, he, whoever he is. He, whoever he is. Okay, so that's the normal, the normal case. Why do we have to say, why do we have to go with Pinchas and Yair? No, no, but what did he do? What does Vayifatach mean? He's just saying, what does Vayifatach mean? He had a, he had a, he had a, a, a muzzle. To, How do you know? It doesn't say muzzle. Mm-hmm. It says Vayifatach et agmalim. And he opened up, he undid the camels. Let's say he undid, an okay. English word. He undid the camels. Okay. What did he undo? He undid the saddle. I thought he undid the saddle from the bags that they were carrying. Somebody else says he undid the bridle that helps to guide them. Somebody else says he undid the muzzles that they had on their face so that he can give them food. After all, he said, and he gave them straw. 
gave them straw, right? So Rashi says he undid the muzzle. Why did they have a muzzle? Because he wanted to make sure they don't eat grass from somebody else's fields. That's what Rashi says. The Ramban says, no, that's not true. That's not possible. Because I say it's the, it's the saddle or the bridle. Because a muzzle, Abraham's camels don't need a muzzle because they would never eat somebody else's fields. Who says that? That's what the Ramban says. Okay. Because the Gemara says that Pinchas ben Yair. Right, so. and, and the Gemara, he's quoting the Gemara. Okay. Rabbi Huna, when Rabbi, Rabbi Yirmiya said to Rabbi Chia, is it possible that the camels of Abraham were not as right, not as careful about the Chamor, like, like the Chamor of Pinchas ben Yair? Meaning, no, it can't be that they have a muzzle. I think it's possible. What about Pinchas and Yair's oh, camel? No, what did he do to no, deserve that? No, he was a great artist. What did he do to deserve he a camel, was, a, a donkey he, like he that? He was the uh, sadic, uh, special. More than Abraham. Uh, super sadic, and this, and that, whatever. More than Abraham. <laughs> I mean, obviously it's a legend, right? But if you take the legend literally that the camel, that the donkey didn't need any special protection from doing something that was halakhically not right, mm -hmm. then the camels of uh, Abraham would also be trained well enough not to do that. Right? But Therefore, they don't need a muzzle. But um, what about all the camels, Moses, Moshe's camels? Uh, well, maybe they didn't eat other people's things also. I don't know. Did Moses have a camel? He said he took, he took the uh, he took the sheep of Chai Hamidbar. Sheep. 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 Right. What did they think? Why did, that, oh, why did he take the sheep out to the desert? They say because he didn't want them to eat in other people's fields. So I guess he wasn't the righteous person yet. Or you remember, by the way, this is this is Tzon uh, Yitro. It's not his Tzon. Oh, okay. All this, right. is, this is the sheep of Yitro he was taking to, to Shevis. So I don't know if that's... Uh, yeah, Yitro, these are Yitro's sheep that he brought up all, all their life. Now they're older sheep. They haven't learned how to not to eat from other people's fields. So Ab Yitz Ab Moshe knew that, and therefore he took them to the desert because he didn't want them to, to graze on other people's fields. Right. He didn't have his own sheep okay. yet. Right. You don't like the story. <laughs> but... <laughs> I'm not as using uh, the story as a. I like it, but you can put the mirror. Yeah. Okay. So we're we're sort of ready, yeah. but but the the main blockbuster was how you read the pasuk. About the the reason that he wanted us to read this thing is to talk about how the animals of tzaddikim have a certain behavior behavior training, right? Yeah. But but what what we saw is how he reads the sentence. That could be. That, that you could, could say, and he means Laban. It's like uh, you have a pet, you train your pet to do certain things. Yeah, sure. Mm. Sure, it's true. I'm, I'm, no, no, I'm no, certain. No, 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 that's all right. Pinchas and Yair was a tzaddik, and it's just this gets uh, extended to the his uh, donkey. donkey. It's a donkey. a donkey. How does Tzitkis extend to the donkey? I don't know. So why not the Campbells of Abraham? Okay, so 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 uh, you don't know. Fine, if it's good enough, I mean, it's it. Okay. Okay, fine. That's just a discussion between uh, Rabbi Yirmiya and the others about about the camels and about the donkey. Okay. So if you accept one of them, right? Okay. Then you accept the other one. Okay. So therefore, what would what did he undo? He undid their saddle. He undid right. their whatever right. their reins, but he didn't undo their muzzle because a muzzle wasn't necessary. That's all he wants to say. Right. So. So we will remember how the brothers sold their brother. Yeah, they, they sold the they sold the Midyani uh, first, who then went on. He, he was sold from hand to hand. He could have been several. So why that is that is the question that, that is, is said here: is why were Abraham's camels tied up in the first place? That they had to be untied. The muzzle. That's the question. Yeah. So the so the answer is not. It's not. He did not believe that he Rashi is not right. They were tied in a different way. They had they had they had saddles on them, but they didn't. So what did we do today? What did we? Oh, Elohei Haaretz. Mm -hmm. Elohei Haaretz was right. the established was the was the main focus right of the first one. What is it? Elohei Haaretz, Elohei Eretz Yisrael. 
people who come to him. But God is directly involved and mm -hmm. dominant and, and related to, and his eyes open on to Eretz Israel, mm -hmm. unlike the other land. And what Abraham meant by saying Elohei HaShamayim, Elohei HaAretz, he meant Elohei HaAretz Azot. Does that mean that the whole world? No, it didn't, because when he said to him, Eliezer said to him, what if the girl doesn't want to come with me, what should I do? So he says to him, I want you not to ever to do that because the God of the heavens who took me out of Haran and brought me to this land will find a way to bring the girl here. And if not, then you are off. You don't have to carry worry about my vow. You see, he says, Allah have the heavens. Why does he say Allah have the heavens all of a sudden without Allah have the Because he's talking about Haran time when he was in a place which does not have Allah have the Hashem is not Allah have the he. He bequeathed uh, direction. He, you could say that other lands are under the dominance of nature. The laws of nature. That's God's angels, right? Uh, there's earthquakes and there's volcanoes and there's fertility and there's not fertility and there's rain and there's not rain and there would be drought. It all happens because of it happens because that's the way the nature of the world is. But Eretz Israel has rain because Hashem says there should be rain. Eretz Israel has drought because Hashem is deciding, you know, their people are not nice, they're not good, I'm going to make a drought. And Hashem says this in Devarim. Moshe says to the people, I want you to know, the land that you're going to is different from all the other lands. It's not like Mitzrayim, that you can bring water by, by digging channels and bringing from the Nile, and everything is natural. But this land is a land which God's eyes are on it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. You will be sustained directly by God doing, right? So you have to ask your God for your allowance. You have to expect that God will give you when you deserve, right? That's what the Eretz Israel is like. Right. Not so glad. Right? That does not make it simple. That makes it more complicated. Or maybe better. But it could also be not. That's what I mentioned. I mean, it's, it's, there's a certain tension. Piece of life to live with, right? You never know. You never know. You do know if the Vedas behave, of course. Mm. That's what he claims. He claims that Eretz Israel is under the direct Hashkacha of the Kadosh Baruch Hu, whether other lands are like. That's what he says. You go out of Eretz Israel, you're in like you have no God. Yeah. Where are we going here? The Ramban says when we are away, we are practicing, practicing, practicing our Judaism. We don't really, we don't really do. We're not really living as Jews. We're living. Practice. We're pre pretending. We're practicing to be Jewish. Because being Jewish is being Jewish in Eretz Israel. What we do here now is so that we don't forget how to be Jewish. So we do it with little things. No green card necessary in Israel. Right. Just say I'm Jewish. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, give me your wisdom. Give us a comment. Today is the bomb. Give us a comment. Comment. They landed on a comet. Would you believe? They landed a spaceship on a comet. A comet, yeah, yeah, Rosetta. A comet. The, the, the Rosetta is the big, the big, uh, Satellite, satellite that is around the comet, yeah. and they send down this thing called not Rosetta. What's the name of it? Feia, Feia, something like that. Yeah. That landed on the comet. Right. Now they think they bounced. They they're not so sure. They, yeah. they could have been bounced a couple of times maybe because they didn't. They were supposed to shoot down harpoons mm -hmm. that would dig into the planet and hold. They didn't shoot. It didn't shoot. It didn't work. So they're worried now whether it is might be failed if they fall into a pit or they fall off. Yeah, because this is a rocks and, and there is no like a bowl like a. It's a very big. Thing. It's yeah. as big as Mount Mount Fuji. Whoa, that's wicked. Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji is a big mountain in uh, in uh, Japan. That's how big this comet is. It's very thin. Mm. And they know, by the way, they think that. Comets are very important that they 
our water on this earth came from comets. We never had water on this earth. You, 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 would you just try to imagine? This planet was first formed, fire, gas, condensed, dry, hot, not fertile, boiling planet. Nothing. Like how did sun. water? How did water ever come here? Not like the sun. We don't. We're not a star. Yes, mm -hmm. but a cooling, cooling, condensed uh, gases. So what happened? So what happened? So so they say that stars out in the universe, also gas stars, they compress and compress and compress until they become a star, and then the star's gravity makes it even more compressed until it becomes a white dwarf, very 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 hot hotter than you can imagine, in that heat, elements are formed, new elements are formed. You can't form elements. Elements are the most basic ingredients of the, of the universe, right? But then the, all there was is helium and hydrogen. That's all there was before. When this gas of helium condensed, the heat was so great that it can produce iron, it can produce H2O, it can produce uh, diamonds, it can produce all kinds of elements, right? in that heat. Mm -hmm. And then the heat is so great that it explodes. Star's gone. The exploded star has all kinds of things that spray into the universe, like water, water and like crystals of something else, of iron and like minerals of all kinds, yes? And they wander in this huge universe, wander, flying around. Look for the record. And, and condense into comets and the comets eventually might maybe fall on the earth and from the comet that it falls on the earth explodes and the water sprays all over the place and you get water on the land of the earth would you imagine this right and we have oceans and we have rivers and we have moisture and we have humidity know. because of water that came from exploding stars that's just, that is actually the belief of how this planet evolved. Take, it took only f four and a half billion years, but... It sounds like an accident, right? It sounds like an accident. Things, you know, wander around, chaos, things bump into each other, you know, explosion. If not for all these little things that happened at the right time in the right place, we wouldn't be alive. There would not be, be, not be life in this place. I mean... That's what he meant when he said, and Hashem separated the waters from below the heavens from the water above the heavens. The water above the heavens is all those wandering crystals, and the water below the heavens is the water on this earth. He allowed the water on this earth to be different from the water, yeah, settled. I mean, the psukim are very, are very enigmatic. Do I get it? No. I'll get it. I'll get it. Don't, don't, don't forget about me.